Hi, everybody. My name is Alexis Boylan, and I am the curator of Seeing Truth and a professor at the University of Connecticut and the director of academic affairs at UCHI. And it is my great pleasure today to interview Chris Newell. I did want to, before we start, thank the Luce Foundation, who has generously funded not only the exhibition, but all of the outreach projects associated with the exhibition and this exhibition programming. And also just let everyone Everybody know that the exhibition will be opening on January 25th. And so stay tuned and sign up to UCHI's listserv and keep your eye on the Twitters and the Instagram and we'll have more information for you. Chris, I like everybody to introduce themselves, A, because I hate introducing people. And I just feel like introdu introductions are often very boring for like when you're just reading them. So, and they're then not personal at all. And there are like weird pieces of information that may or not may not be meaningful to you personally. So Chris, who are you and what do you do? And yeah, who are you? Uh, Dan Gok, uh, Neil and Flewi is Kalistipa, Peskuda Magari, Neil, Naga Chkwapnakig. Hi, how are you? Good to Hi. see you. My name is Chris Newell. And I am a Paspaquati from Madoknaguk, which is part of a larger group of tribes called Wabanaki or the people of the Don. And I'm an educator. A lot of people give me a lot of different labels, but basically all of my work is around education and uh, I do a lot of different things with it. So I am the co-founder of something called Egamount Educational Initiative, which is a business partnership with a, a few colleagues of mine where we work in all areas of education here in the Southern New England region, you know, uh, K through 12 schools, colleges, universities, as well as museums to work to help these institutions incorporate native content in a culturally competent fashion, and also to build the bridges of relationships with the local Native communities here. I am also the former executive director of the Abbey Museum, which is the state of Maine's only Smithsonian affiliate. It's a, a small museum on the island of Mount Desert Island in Bar Harbor, Maine, which is dedicated specifically to Wabanaki cultures. And I am the very first Wabanaki executive director of that museum. Although, you know, with the pandemic and the way life works, Works out. I am back here in Connecticut in my wife's homeland, living in Mashantucket, and currently working as the tribal community member in residence for the University of Connecticut. And I should say, I actually came to know about Chris through his reputation and his public lectures. But I have to say, Chris, you also have a very lively and amazing Twitter account that I stalk. I don't really understand the politics and the... I don't know the politeness of Twitter, so maybe it is rude to stalk you, but your Twitter makes me happy every single day and or it makes me very mad every single day because of things that are going on in the world. So everybody should check that out as well. I, most people don't use that as a way to introduce themselves, but I just want our audience to know it is a lively and worth looking into account. Are you an Instagrammer too, or just a Twitter? I, I am an Instagrammer. Yeah. So that, yeah. that one's noodles, 2009. So okay. it's just a different All right. I'll check it out. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to, and as I said, I came to know Chris through reputation and through your work at the Abbey Museum and as through sort of museum work. So I was actually wondering if you could start us off talking a little bit about about your relationship with museums, how you've worked with museums, uh, just sort of your, your history with museum and, and, and sort of that kind of space. Because I know as an educator, you work in all kinds of spaces, but I really, you know, part of what we're doing with this exhibition is really focusing on museums as problematic entities communicating knowledge. So I, I was wondering if you could sort of speak to your work as an educator with museums. Absolutely. You know, before I became an educator in a museum, you know, just I was a patron of museums, you know, as a, as a child, I loved museums, all museums, it didn't matter where or when, you know, when we had a school trip in Washington County, Maine, it's very rural. So it, it was kind of rare, we did get to go to a museum. And when we did, those were oftentimes my, my favorite trips, because of all I got to be exposed to and learn. And as a child, I can remember that, you know, museums became trusted places, I really trusted everything all the information as it was presented. So there was a lot of joy, definitely for me, you know, in going to museums. However, when I would go to museums that would be historical and they would feature, you know, historical artifacts from native peoples, um, I was oftentimes confused by the difference 
in, in the way Native peoples were often represented in those spaces. So they would have pieces of art and they wouldn't have the name of the artist. Sometimes they would guess at the tribe. You know, things like that were going on. And, uh, you know, terminology that I, I had grown up in, in in our community, you know, my, my father spoke Passamaquoddy first. My grandmother lived with us, also spoke Passamaquoddy. So Passamaquoddy was the language primarily spoken in our house. And I was always brought up with, you know, cultural terminology that I understood. And it was not being used in these spaces. And it kind of varied all over the place. And I was wondering why that was, you know. So even as much as I love museums as a child, I was definitely confused, you know, at times with historical museums. To back that up even more, my father's generation as Native peoples, as a classical party person, you know, they, they wouldn't even walk into many historical museums, much less work for one. You know, this is a change that you're starting to see that's relatively recent. And uh, the reason why is because museums have become or have historically been a place of uh, sometimes pain with uh, the collection of ancestors' remains, the holding on to them sometimes with, with all their might, their, their institutional might and everything that they have. So visiting those spaces where your literal blood ancestors are are in the collection is a, a scary thing. It's it, just imagine that you imagine yourself being in there someday after you're you're gone. I mean, there's a lot of things that go through your head, you know, and museums are just starting to reconcile with that over the past couple of decades. And it's really started to gain momentum recently, you know, as more Native peoples enter the museum field. Now, how I entered the museum field is I kind of backed into it. You know, I uh, was a singer with the Mystic River Singers for a long time. Loved that life. I got to spend time in Native communities all over the U.S. and Canada. Uh, the type of education I could never get in, in a Native American studies class in a college campus, right? Now, there's no college degree that could give me the information that I was able to learn through my life experiences through that. But you know, a gas starts to hit $4 a gallon, first under the Bush administration and traveling all the way out West to where most powwows are with, with the drum group was, it was a tough prospect when you have a, a wife and kids, uh, it gets more and more expensive. And basically it, at one point it was cheaper to fly than it was to drive. So, uh, you know, my, my future in, in that lifestyle, I, I really started to re-examine it. And so I had started a bachelor's degree originally at Dartmouth College and dropped out of Dartmouth. Uh, for various different reasons. But when I did drop out, I became a member of the Mystic River Singers and went from there. I decided to go back to, to college and, you know, uh, follow basically my, my father's path in that he graduated from Harvard University in 1971 with a graduate degree in education. And so I, I kind of want to follow that same path because I had grown up watching him do this work, you know, uh, not just the education for museums or helping museums, which he, he, he eventually got over his own personal grievances grievances with museums and, and got to that point, but all places of education. And so I, I actually, when I tell people I don't have a high advanced degree, but I went to the school of Wayne Newell is the way I, I typically describe it. You know, there's this, and people that know his career, 50 plus years, know how much of an impact he had, not just for our tribe, but for the state of Maine and also for this country. So I was lucky in that. I mean, there's so much I learned at the kitchen table that, you know, that just was not available to a lot of other folks. And uh, so I wanted to go into education, you know, and I uh, was living in Mashantucket. My, my wife is Mashantucket Pequot, by the way, I guess should, <laughs> should mention that. So I was living in Mashantucket and the, I decided to apply for the Pequot Museum, a museum educator job, entry level. And when I got there, you know, I'd, I'd known the Pequot Museum since it opened. I'd, I'd been through those exhibits. I'd, you know, loved them for a lot of different reasons. If you don't, have never been there before, by the way, you should go, especially if you're in this region. The Pequot Museum is located in Mashantucket. It's it's 185,000 square feet of exhibit space that's going to tell the history of the region unapologetically from the Pequot perspective. Now, I, I didn't necessarily appreciate that as a patron until I started to work there. Because when I, you start to give tours in that place, especially to children, you realize a, a few things. Number one, the amount of erasure of Native peoples, especially in the Southern New England region, is vast. And that is fed by the museums. Museums themselves, the way we at Egmont describe them, are artifacts of colonization. You know, so museums are colonial artifacts themselves. So, you know, preserving history in this way, collecting institutions, it all, it all comes with the arrival of Europeans. So we, what we, get, we began to see is so it was not uncommon for a child raised in Connecticut or even their parent at times to be in the tour and raise their hand innocently because it's just pressing on their mind and just ask this question, are the Pequot still alive? Right. So that's where they were at. 
And they're just coming to this realization that, oh, wait a minute, well, we're, you know, Pequots are alive, so they have to ask, right? And so we're, we're getting those questions. And so it, it let us know how deep the erasure really is throughout the state. Um, and what ends up happening, though, is so students ask those questions, right? And sometimes it's, they, they might feel uncomfortable because they feel like they should know, and like their school should have taught them, yet it didn't. You know, so they find a safe place in there to ask that question. And yes, they get answered. Yes, not only are they alive, you're in their tribal museum next to Foxwoods Casino, which contributed to over $4 billion to your state's economy since it opened. The community is right next door and I'm married and have children that are mashing tuck at Pequot. So, you, you know, and so it lights these children's eyes up to realize that the bias that they were fed, they weren't given a story that the Pequots are all dead and gone. It's just kind of there was lack of representation and a lack of talking about them. And so when they're introduced to the topic, they hear about the Pequot massacre, which is a big piece of history for the state of Connecticut uh, in the colonial days. And they think, you know, that that was the end of the Pequots back at that time. And they, by the time they leave the museum, they find out about the history of survivance through very harsh times of colonization all the way up until their federal recognition in 1983. And then eventually their, their economic turnaround, just for the, for the Mashantuckets, I should say, not for the Eastern Pequots who are not recognized. We're the same people, by the way, but you know, that's, that's America for you when it comes to that stuff. But at least for the Mashantucket Pequots, their economic turnaround, you know, from 179 acres, originally a 2,500 acre reservation that was encroached upon illegally, and then 700 acres sold illegally you know, down to 179 acres. That's what they had in the 80s, in the early 80s. Now the reservation has expanded to a little over a thousand acres and people have economic opportunity to come work for their own community again. History had scattered them. Now they are back and, and they are, you know, a multi-generational community again. And that was a, that, that's a big deal because those children that experience that story, right? They hear the good, the bad, and the ugly of how Connecticut became to be Connecticut. But when they leave the museum, they are changed and they're actually more excited than when they showed up. I mean, they, they show up plenty excited. They actually leave there more excited than when they showed up. And it was an experience where they, you know, multiple children would pretty much every trip would remark, this is the best trip I've ever been on, best field trip I've ever been on. So I saw the power in that. Yeah. But what was taught at the Pequot, or what is taught at the Pequot Museum is not taught in Connecticut. It's not taught in, in historical museums in, in the region. And uh, so, you know, my colleagues and I that worked there, that we eventually became Agamal Educational Initiative, we decided that we wanted to unsilo what was in the Pequot Museum to just be taught as history. We started making institutional partnerships with the Pequot Museum and educational institutions like Connecticut College, University of Connecticut. Eventually things happen, right? My, my colleagues colleagues and I move on, but we didn't want to see that partnership work end because we saw the value of it. And so we, we came together and formed Agamal Educational Initiative to essentially grow this work in the region. And, you know, we're, we're not the experts. So my, myself, I'm Pastor Quaddy living in Connecticut. I'm a visitor to this region. These tribes in this region can speak for themselves. So that's one of the things is the example I set in, in how I do this work. And I always introduce myself as a visitor to this particular region. My partner, Jason Mancini, is non-native, right? So he describes himself as an ally, a non-native ally. And then in Donna Spears is Dene Ojibwe Chickasaw Choctaw. She is from Arizona. She's married into the Narragansett tribe. She's not from this region either. So we describe ourselves as guests and we are not the experts on these tribes. We don't present ourselves as such, but we can become kind of like the, the way that these institutions can partner themselves and make relationships with these communities so that their information can now enter in there in, a, once again, a culturally competent fashion to get over the way that the English language talks about Native peoples, the singularization, right? The Native culture, right? There's a thousand plus different Native cultures on this continent here. I don't know how you singularize that as one, you know, that, but that's how America has been writing about us for so long. And that's an implicit bias that gets fed even in museums. And another, another thing that happens is, uh, you know, these museums in the region, especially, you know, we work with Boston museums quite a bit and uh, they're starting to examine their positionality in the way they tell their history. So Revolutionary Spaces, which is the nonprofit that runs the old South Meeting House, as well as uh, the Massachusetts Old State House is 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 now grappling with how to tell the histories of how scout proclamations were written in the same building where the Declaration of Independence was read. 
right? Uh, uh, you know, things like that are, are starting to become part of the history of these places. And we're telling all the good, the bad, the ugly. And the response is actually in the positive because people are realizing that we're not getting a sanitized history anymore. So that's where I see the value in, in what we're doing here is that we can, at times, you know, it, with our museum specialty or just in education, you know, do some of the shaping of, of things, but we can also be the bridge that creates long-term relationships with these institutions, which is mutually beneficial because those communities can now tell their stories within the walls of these institutions. The institutions no longer feed implicit bias that Wampanoag people or Pequot people are all dead and gone. And we don't get those questions back at the Pequot Museum anymore, right? And we have a better educated populace here. And that's really what it's all about is how do we create a better, more informed world for all of us, not just for Native people, but we all live here now, right? You know, Native, non-Native people from different countries, you name it, we all live here now, right? How can we live a more informed future that is going to benefit all of us? And that includes Native people as well. So I'm going to I'm going to push at you Chris. I think one of the things I really like about your answer and just your sort of conversation about museums and that I think is so valuable is you actually started the conversation by talking about trust and about joy. And then talking about how your dad though seemed to in the beginning of his career have none of those relationships with museum space. But I I actually am really drawn to this idea that you, that you're advocating of museums as sites of intimacy. That you go to those spaces and you as a child wanted to trust them and you wanted to find joy in them and did find joy in them. So this is where I'm going to push back. So many people feel that, but this is a real bad moment for museums in general. Everything that is on the news about museums is about, I mean, basically a horror show of how many human remains still, after so much work has been done, how museums have been so nefarious and holding on to things and bodies and have been disrespectful of those remains and requests to not do DNA testing. And I mean, like that even when there is the law on the side of the people who want their relatives and history and bodies back, there has been nothing that gets in the news, I think, especially, but sort of, you know, I think if we want to be generous, we can just say sloppiness, but it's hard to make an argument for sloppiness when it actually just seems like there's so much very purposeful attempts to move around the law, move around Native peoples, move around what is the ethical thing to do. Mm -hmm. Also, though, it's a mess in terms of hiring non-white peoples. It's a mess of strikes. They're not even paying people, you know, the way that they should in these museum spaces. That if you look at the sort of story of museums in 2022, I feel your desire for these intimate, joyful places. But there is also an argument to be made that maybe these are just corrupt institutions that need to end or be reimagined in such a profound way that they do not resemble in power structures, anything that that, that 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 they become unrecognizable as museums and become recognizable as something else. So from your answer before, I know that you clearly don't agree with that, but like, like try to convince me. Because again, I think that if you were just, you know, if you were looking at the internet's machine about what's going on in museums right now, like it's a shit show. It's terrible. And how can we have faith in these institutions? How do we still give them our trust and our joy? That, that's a great question, you know, and you might be surprised. I'm not actually advocating for people at, in, mo in modern day times to have that trust and joy. I think that museums still have a long way to go in grappling with their own personal histories and what they've done. And also the sciences of anthropology and archaeology. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give a, an example of uh, the Peabody Museum at Harvard it was basically founded, the science of archaeology that, that, that the founders of, of that museum, off of remains that were found on islands in what is now the state of Maine, that they decided based off of their assessment, which was, you know, very limited in, in what they were able to find, but there were definitely remains of bodies that they were, you know, unearthing. They decided a new theory that these were not 
my ancestors or, or Wabanaki ancestors, you know, the, the entire tribal region there, all the tribes together are known as Wabanaki. They're not Wabanaki ancestors, but they're a different, you know, race, literally, that, that's where they went, a different race of people known as the red paint people. And the reason why they got that name, it was kind of the, the newspapers doing that, they would find red ochre in the burials, you know, and so that became part of the original collection of the Peabody Museum. And Niagara gets passed 30 years ago. And because of the theory that the red, these were red paint people, these were not Wabanaki people. And, and the theories were a little crazy because it literally, like, for some reason, they just disappear off of the archaeological record. And they imagine that a tidal wave had wiped the entire culture out, you know, like uh, just a lot of things that to me were insane, right? And, you know, and, and to our communities. And, and one of the things I, I tell people is that when it comes to this fight, you know, to, to get this done, it's multi generational. It took multiple generations for museums to get this way. It's going to take multiple generations to undo it. That's the reality of this work. I will probably not live to see my intended result. So I'm still very critical of museums in a lot of way because Harvard just finally repatriated after 30 years of us marking at them, those remains. They had in the years prior given the funerary objects that were associated with them, and they now have given the remains and they have been turned properly and they are finally resting. Right. You know, so that's something that Harvard can't hide from. Right. They need to be real about that. And you know, the Peabody, I should say, and Harvard University even, you know, needs to be real about that. Harvard was when, you know, began as, a, as an institution to Christianize natives. So being real about those spaces uh, is something that uh, I really am trying to uh, that, that's what my work is really all about. I, I walk into these spaces and I, I typically call them out for how things are done, but it's you, you can't just do it from the content side. You know, when it comes to this work, it's really about the structure. Most museums are nonprofit. The nonprofit structure, typically your, your board of directors or board of trustees are your biggest donors, right? And so inherently, since the creation of that model, that's typically one demographic for most museums, right? It's rich white folks sitting on those boards making the decisions for policies for the institution. And that's the structure that we need to look at to undo, right? So when I look at museums that are actively working to undo the structure, then I see a future for them where not only the content changes, but the power dynamic will change. It hasn't happened yet. The power dynamic is still very much in favor of the colonial structure. But what I tell people is, as Native peoples, it does us no good to be absent from these spaces because they are interpreting our lives and cultures to the public regardless. Nice. And so getting in there, right, and, and rattling a few cages, as I, as I tend to do about, you know, proper representation, telling the good, the bad, and the ugly of all of it so that we can have an understanding of how we got here and learn from the mistakes from the past, mm -hmm. right? So museums, if they're not willing to do that, then I'm going to sit on the outside and I'm going to be a harsh, harsh critic of them. If they do want to change, then I have to see more than just the hire of a curator or something of that sort. I, I want to see Native people on the board. And that's one of the, one of the reasons why I took the job at the Abbey Museum, because that museum, prior to my arrival under Cinnamon Catlin Legutko, had been going under what they, you know, what, what they were calling a decolonization process. And it was, it started with the content, but it went to the board. And by the time I got there, the board was already over 50% Wabanaki people. It wasn't the biggest donors. It was people who had cultural knowledge that to contribute to the policy creation of how that particular museum was going to be run. And so it's a different space, you know, for a, a, a Native person to sit as an executive director. In. And, and that's one of the reasons why I went there. I, I'm working for a new colonial institution in my life right now, a land grant university, University of Connecticut. This place, you know, exists because of the dispossession, and that's a very kind word, of Native lands, not just in this region, but although also as the country expanded West. Right? Can you actually, can you expand on that? Because I worry that our listeners won't 100% understand what it means because I mean I have been at UConn long enough to hear land grant university as what presidents and provosts bragged about so when you say this like I'm at a land grant university what does that mean 
what is what are you talking about when you say that? That's a phrase that has been used in a lot of different ways in different yeah. contexts. I just want to make sure our, our our the people watching and and listening know what you're talking about when you say it like that. Okay, so every land grant institution has its own history, but the simple way to to break it down for UConn is UConn began as an agricultural school. It was granted land as an agricultural school, basically to train a a, a, a young white settler workforce to settle native lands that had been taken away. So that the, the Yukon actually stands as, as, as a, a tool of colonization rather than a tool against it, but it exists here. Also in the creation of the university, it wasn't just these the tribes here that lost land. As the country expanded west, right? One of the things they did is they would, the country under the, it's, it's literally the Supreme Court decided this, that the United States owns land uh, basis of the doctrine of discovery. If they found land that was unimproved, right, it, which is how Native peoples were stewarding the land, which is not the way the English saw it, where it should be all the forests cut down and fences built and cows, chickens, pigs get raised for, for money. That's how land should be used for in their mindset. So it, it was literally they would kill bison, drive Native people out through war, other means, and then they would homestead it, right? The Homestead Act basically said if you just squat on a piece of land and, and improve it, which meant building a fence and an outhouse, <laughs> then it was yours forever, you know? So when that would happen, some of those parcels were sold by the United States government to private landowners and that money ended up going into the pool of money that was fueling the University of Connecticut. So it's all part of a system, right? So I'm here working here at this in this system currently right now, you know, and uh, my positionality is one where I'm, I'm really here to help this place find a way to actually serve a purpose that goes beyond the land acknowledgement that people say at opening of events, right? right? If you're just saying those words, you're checking a box, that's it. I'm going to call you out for that. And I've been working since I graduated from UConn in 2014 to improve the Native experience for Native students on this campus. And one of our first clients as Egamount was the Dodd Research Center. When Glenn Matoma was here, we also worked with the Humanities Institute, as well as the Neog School of Education. One of the things I keep pushing is the land acknowledgement that we worked with Dodd when they worked with the communities to write that became adopted by the university. If the university is going to adopt it, then they got to put some action behind it. It, you know, and so hiring of Native faculty was one of the things we pushed for. Dodd Research Center also pushed for that very hard. That happened, right? And so we got Native faculty here. Now a faculty are forming the Native American Indigenous Studies Initiative here. And so Yukon, which has historically disregarded Native peoples in this, not just in the region, but just in general, you know, because it was a very, very lonely experience as a student here for me, you know, because I had no one to network with, like I did at Dartmouth College, which has a very strong Native program which is 50 years old, you know, so this is a public university, though, it's not a, a private Ivy League, where only 60% of the people get in, this is more accessible to Native peoples in this region. And so what I see is the United States government has created tried to uh, undo some of the things and created the tribal college university program TCUs. There are no TCUs east of the Mississippi. There's no TCUs in this region for Northeastern tribes. Mm -hmm. So when people from my community do want to take the plunge of leaving our community and going into a college experience, if they want to have Native people in that experience, they end up applying to one of the Ivy Leagues, Harvard or, or, or Dartmouth, maybe they get in, or they have to go all the way to Haskell University in Kansas, right? And that still is a difficult, you know, the, the, the tribal cultures from that region are so different. So it's still a difficult transition, no matter which way you call it. And so what I see in the future of this place is that UConn as a public university with its land grant status actually owes Native people, not just in the state, but through the region here, an opportunity for a, a, a good quality education. I love the quality of the education I got here at the University of Connecticut. So I'm, I'm totally fine with that. And I think that more Native people should have that, but they're not going to succeed here if we do not have the foundation of 
support that is necessary for them to do so because leaving our isolated communities sometimes I mean most of many people live off reservation but if you're coming from a reservation in a very isolated community coming to a college campus is like going to a whole different country and you run into things like biases that Americans have about Native peoples and things like that it feels like racism although the person didn't intend it that way right but that's how it feels to you on this campus and that's the experience I want to change so that our graduation rates change from 30 to 50 percent to 90 percent you know like it should be everywhere else I know that the AMNH just redid their North American or their their North Pacific Native American hall which was a a very, I mean, the thing that's interesting about that hallway is that it became such a sort of cultural marker, you know, that sort of, that, that very famous people wrote about it. A lot of artists went there and were very influenced by what they saw. They recently reinstalled it, a lot more Indigenous representation in terms of curatorial voices and, and very much more sort of contemporary artists represented to prevent some of what you were talking about earlier, which is this idea that this is a story. I mean, again, and, and, and this is a story that settler colonialists have been selling to white people and children truly like the 18th century, which is that Native Americans are dying out, they're gone, that is that is the past. And so, I mean, I think, you know, the, the need to keep replicating that is because it is not true. I was using that as an example to actually get you to talk about, can you tell our audiences some places that you think are getting it right? Places that you think, curators that are bringing something really new and exciting to the story of indigenous art and populations. Even a museum, again, that sort of is proactively making decisions about their installation and design. So not through lawsuits or somebody exposing them to the press, but actually like what are sort of your guideposts of who's doing this right and who's really making an impact? Where should we go if we want to see this happening and in a restorative way? Mm, that's such a great question. You know, the, the answer is probably going to disappoint folks, but I, I, you know, I can't really point to a place that is doing it right, right. You know, yeah, I can even be critical of the Pequot Museum. I can be critical of the Abbey Museum, even in, in some of those practices. And what I tell people is that it's the slow progress to get this to change. Right. But, you know, what you should look for is when Native people take over colonial museum spaces and pay attention to what's going on there. So the Yale Art Museum had an exhibit a few years back, and that was, that was our, like our last live gig before the pandemic hit, you know, where the, the student curators curated an exhibit. And they did a lot of things that were definitely out of the norm for the way Native arts are represented. So rather than just saying unknown artist, they said artist once known. Right. right. Simple things like that, you know, actually puts a human being attached to that object again. And it also reveals that name didn't matter. Right. So that's actually the museum kind of being a, a little bit vulnerable and saying that this is a screw up of the museum field, right, by, by, by allowing it to happen that way. When they would put clothing on display, rather than laying it flat and putting it in a glass case, they put it on mannequins and there was no glass cases. People could take a 360 view so they could view clothing as you would view fashion. Students were saying, this is a new museum experience we want you to have through an indigenous lens in this very colonial space. One of the things I would, I would encourage people to do is to visit tribal museums, right? Because now you have tribes taking this model, right, the colonial artifact of the museum, and interpreting it to their own, their own narrative of, of how they see themselves. And they, they oftentimes don't cater necessarily to what's popular, right? It's more about what's true for their communities, because what's in those museums has accountability to everybody in the community. Um, so the Pequot Museum is an example, but if you ever get out to Arizona, the Navajo Nation Museum, is a great example where 90% of the clientele that come through the door are not non-native people, they're Navajo people, right? So how does a museum like that present itself to Navajo students as they come through? So the signage is not in English, 
It's in Navajo because that's where they, they're still fluent speakers and they're, they're teaching it to their children. It normalizes for folks that English is not the language of this land. It's, it's, it's a foreign language to this land. So little projects that I do see happening, the MFA Boston is one that I'm very critical of, but I'm also partners with and I'm helping to work them change. One of the things they did that I actually liked, they experimented with something called a translation project, which once again goes into that idea of normalizing that, you know, not everybody that comes through the museum doors English is their first language, you know, that's, it's just, and so what they did was they took the sixth most spoken language in the current city of Boston, and they would take pieces that were typically, you know, described one way in English, and they would describe them in the languages from the countries or the cultures that they came from. And that included Wabanaki cultures, you know, there was a, a, a picture of John Bowden in, in what, you know, the gentleman who founded Bowden College in a, a landscape painting, which is typical of, of landscape photos, they paint themselves in the land to basically say, this is mine, you know, and so the way he's standing in the, which was uh, kind of a mixture of Passamaquoddy and Penobscot interpretation, if you were to understand it, the way he's being described is he's standing there as if he he owns everything, but, you know, he doesn't really own anything. And he's, he's, and he's called Ginjemus, which comes from our language, King James, right? So our understanding of an English king is that somebody who thinks they are in charge but is not really in charge of anything. And that's how he's standing in, in, you know, and that's what's brought out if you understand our language. So our children would be able to go into that and they would see that and they would see themselves reflected in the space where normally they, they, they aren't. Paul Revere's bowl, you know, had different interpretations, one for the silver coming from, you know, which was mined by indigenous Americans south of the border we now call Mexico. And, you know, the, the shape of it has nothing to do with America. It was actually inspired by Asian bowls from China. And so, you know, the, the English language interpretation, Paul Revere, Americana, blah, blah, blah. Now it has these other interpretations in other languages and people can see themselves reflected in that. And that to me is a step, right, in this process. You know, they didn't, they didn't actually go into making this a permanent thing museum wide yet, you know, so they're not there. But at least they're playing with the ideas that, you know, there's more of an audience than, than the English speaking Americans coming through their doors, which would also include native peoples as well. So by making the place, you know, having our language represented in there, that's an experience that, you know, rather than me being confused as a child, I would go in there and be like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, they talk to some of our people. They, 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 they get this, right? And I wouldn't feel so confused. Yeah. And this is my space. I mean, I think that that, that sort of feeling of, I mean, I think it's interesting because you did sort of talk about not ownership, but trust is about an exchange. It is about feeling this sort of way of like, I have investments and people have investments in me. I could talk to you for hours and hours, but, and, and hopefully we will get to do so at another, at another venue or moment. But I want to ask you two final questions that we've been asking everybody who's done this sort of series. The first is instigator objects. Did anything call out to you from the Seeing Truth exhibition? Did anything provoke you? Again, the idea of the instigator object is to think about objects as not sort of stable and as having one story, but to think about them as instigating a conversation, provocations, that sort of thing. Did anything um, Did anything sort of provoke you or, um, or call your yeah. eye? The, the cosmic globe, just because of my, my understanding of why mapping was done historically, basically to lay claim, to, to dis discover lands and say it was ours and decide for themselves back in their home countries. And globe making is, is also part of that story as well. Globes were sometimes made to scare people away from certain, so the, the, the you know, even though it's not about the actual world itself, right? It, it, it uses that model to, you know, to talk about zodiac signs and things like that, because I see globes as basically Euro culture, you know? Right. And so it, it, it really, that, that's what I see this piece end, end up, you know, is it taking zodiac signs from one European culture and just basically it, it kind of homogenizes it with the shape for me. That's, that's the reaction I get because of my experience with globes and mapping. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think, I mean, one thing that I would also sort of say that, and, and again, this is for, for you, Chris, and for people who come out to the exhibition, we're going to have a lot of conversation about maps and about who gets included and who gets excluded and what contemporary artists and a number of indigenous artists have done to rethink how we can challenge map making and knowledge making in that way. And the AMNH, of course, has a very interesting history in terms of how they have represented the universe 
universe and the cosmos. And, and that's a conversation for a different time, but they actually, at one point in their history, they had a very large, the sort of entryway mural was actually an indigenous, a visualization by a white artist of an indigenous story of the universe's creation. It was packed away. It was moved out in place to put in, you know, more scientific and what many would deem sort of more realistic or, you know, science oriented. It's a really interesting problem because it's a very problematic piece. And yet it also suggests that other peoples have had knowledge and ideas about the cosmos and that this is important to think about. And so it's this very sort of complicated, even in that space, which ostensibly is just about stars and planets and that sort of thing, that that that, that there's this sort of element of who gets the authority to speak and that sort of thing. So final question, and I'm going to give you the ground rules for this because everybody wants to break the ground rule. I would like you to tell me one truth that you know. And everybody's like, I'm going to give you two. And I'm going to say, no, I need one. So tell me one thing that you know is true. And then tell me how you know it's the truth and what evidence you can supply that for you proves the truth of this statement. I would say my truth is not all of the truth. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because there is no point in my life where I consider myself at a point where I, where I stop learning, you know, so there's, there's always room for improvement, for learning better and for doing better. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if I say that my truth today is the truth for myself or even for anybody, then I kind of limit myself to what could happen to me in the future and what I could learn from that. So no truth. You don't want it. You're not claiming it. I love it. Thank you so much, Chris. This has been really fun and such an interesting conversation. And I am so excited to have you here at UConn as my colleague and I'm excited for us to continue having these conversations going forward. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah. Take care. Right. Bye.